This month, the blueprint for the next America's Cup is out. But it's not what many were expecting. Under the skin of a Fast 40 Plus, we get the tour. Plus the biggest, most advanced yachts in the world lock horns in stunning Sardinia. But first, we've trawled team biographies, we've analysed their previous performance, yeah, we've interviewed the crews and tuned into the pit lane gossip. All to create the World Sailing Show form guide to the Volvo Ocean Race. Seven identical boats, seven hungry teams. Among them, 14 crew who have won the event before. Every team bar one has at least one crew member that has tasted Volvo victory. There are five Olympic gold medal winners in the fleet and nine America's Cup victories. The message is clear. The 2017 Volvo Ocean Race fleet is awash with talent. This will be the second time that the Volvo 65s have been used for the race and the knowledge as to how to make them go quickly has been shared around the fleet. Evidence that points to this being the closest race in the 45-year history of the event. This month, we take a close look at the teams and the key players in our guide and rankings ahead of the start. The seven-boat fleet can be split into three groups. First, the front runners. Starting with skipper Shabby Fernandez, you could list the entire team as key players. It's what makes them the favourites. But particular focus will be on how 49er world champion and America's Cup winner Blair Tuk fares, along with Olympic gold medalist Tamara Echegoyen. Charles Cordrelier came close to victory last time around, and with navigator Pascal Bedigori with him again, the team is among the favourites. Only two of their crew are new to the Volvo. Jeremy Bayou is one of the world's top solo offshore sailors. And Marie Ryu is a four-time NACRA 17 world champion. Runners up last time, skipper Bao Becking and navigator Andrew Cape have more Volvo round the world experience than the rest of their crew put together. Among the Volvo first-timers, America's Cup winning helmsman Peter Burling will be a focus of attention. This race sees several key changes. At 45,000 miles, it's the longest in the history of the event and includes a return to long southern ocean legs. The opening stages have changed too. Leg one takes the fleet from Alicante to Lisbon via a number of turning points. Then it's the big one, 7,000 miles from Lisbon to Cape Town, South Africa, a leg that puts real pressure on the teams. While the next group is stacked with talent, they've spent less time training afloat, but only a fool would write them off. Previously with Alba Medica, skipper Charlie Enright and Mark Towell are back again under a different team name. Their solid crew includes navigator Simon Fisher, Phil Harmer, Damien Foxall, and Tony Mutter, who have all won previous Volvos. Just a week before the start, news broke that Simeon Tienpont would no longer skipper the team. Instead, Brad Jackson would take the reins. A cool-headed Kiwi with six previous races under his belt, Jackson is a safe pair of hands. Navigator Jules Salter and Yoko Signorini are from the same mould with three races apiece to their names. Among the newcomers, Olympic gold medalist Martin Grail will be the focus of attention. While the boats are the same, the crew makeup is different this time. A new rule on crew gender has provided an incentive for teams to be mixed. And for the first time, there are women in all of the teams. There's also a great deal of Olympic experience in the fleet. A distinct advantage when it comes to close quarters racing. This is home for me. I uh, am normally doing these in-port nearly races in my 49er. Uh, it's kind of the same thing, so uh, I definitely feel comfortable and confident <laughs> more than the big ocean thing. That's uh, the guys are definitely yeah. used to that. 
you could argue that all of these boats here are more equal than the 49ers that we race at the Olympics. You know, you, we would be pretty comfortable to jump on someone else's boat and be straight away in tune. At the end of the day, it's your sailing skills, which are going to, and your way you set up the boats and um, trim the sails and all of that, that is the difference. So, yeah, I think that predominantly is where Olympic class sailors are, are best. Our final group were the last to the party. These teams will start the event playing catch up, but there's still plenty to impress in their crew lineups. The combination of Dee Kafari and offshore rock star Brian Thompson makes for an accomplished foundation for this team. Combined with Martin Stromberg and Liz Wardley, there's further depth to the crew. Kafari has created the biggest sailing squad of the fleet, where the balance between male and female sailors will be 50-50. Straight talking David Witt is back in the Volvo Ocean Race after a 20 year absence. He's joined by Steve Hales, who, with five previous races to his name, is the most experienced on board. But Luke Parkinson knows what victory looks like having won the last race aboard Abu Dhabi. So, what will make for ultimate success? Cordrelier believes there is a new focus for the next race. I think last time we were the first one to really take the inshore seriously at the beginning. Sometimes the inshore leg is a, like the start of a race, so it, and because the differences are so small, it's very important to lead at the first mark. So I think everybody take it more seriously now. So over the next nine months, the action that decides the final outcome could happen much closer to the shore. It's awards time. The appeal of the America's Cup is clear. Win the silver trophy and you can make the rules. From the type of boat to the format of the racing, the cup holder can reshape and remodel the richest prize in sailing. The lure of creating a new chapter in sailing history has proved irresistible, at least for those that can afford to mount a campaign. So having won the 35th America's Cup, the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, represented by Emirates Team New Zealand, now gets to set the next agenda. As we promised when we won the America's Cup, we're delivering today a fair document, a fair protocol, which respects the mutual consent agreement within the deed of gift. And there are big changes in store. First of all, the boat. As has been well reported, it's a monohull. Um, its length overall is uh, 75 feet. Uh, and the drawings of that boat and the concept will be released on November the 30th. So out go the high-speed foiling catamarans, and the hints are that the new single-hulled machines will include hydrofoils. We Emirates Team New Zealand have been the primary driver of this technology foiling move in multi-hulls, and we really like the opportunity to make sure that we can put that emphasis now into monohulls and to bring them up to that same level over a period of years. But while the boats may be new, much of the landscape ahead is not. The venue for the next cup will be Auckland in 2021. The cup came here originally after the Kiwis won it in San Diego in 1995. In 2000, Luna Rossa were the challengers, but the Italians lost. 17 years and three campaigns later, Luna Rossa is back for what they hope will be a rematch. 
Leading the team once again is their principal backer, Patrizio Batelli. Ci troviamo adesso in una situazione completamente diversa, in cui i valori di riferimento della Coppa vengono ristabiliti, come lo sono la tradizione prerogative dei rispettivi ruoli. Others have also declared their intention to compete, among them Britain's Land Rover BAR. Until this year, the last time a British team had campaigned for the Cup was in Auckland, in Monahans. Group Armour Team France has also announced its intention to compete. And there are new teams forming in the wings too. Among them, a challenge from the New York Yacht Club represented by two big players in the monohull racing scene. Velamente's owner, Hack Fauf, a three-time world champion in the Maxi 72 class. And five-time champion of the TP52 class, Doug DeVos. Both with reputations for building strong, successful teams. But some are yet to be convinced. Artemis Racing said it was considering whether to participate in this cycle or await the next. The most important consideration for our team is the need for a cutting edge boat design, one that results in speeds that are as fast or faster than in the last America's Cup held in Bermuda. To some, the major about turn in the Cup will come as a shock. To others, this is the true spirit and character of the event. You win the cup, you make the rules. Coming up next, they were racing for one of the oldest trophies aboard some of the newest boats. We get under the skin of a fast 40 plus. Welcome back. Still to come, stunning Sardinia plays host to the biggest, most advanced yachts in the world. But first, new boats competing for an old trophy. We go to the One Ton Cup and get a guided tour of a Fast 40 Plus. It's frantic. I mean, the start line is as busy as any big one design fleet you'll see. This fleet is really close. Places change at every mark rounding. There's more boats here than there are at the TP52s. We're here to learn and we're going to give them a fight later on. We're not there yet. It was very fun though. When 12 closely matched Grand Prix boats are racing for a prestigious and ornate trophy that dates back to 1899, it's inevitable that the competition will be tight. But even by the standard set in the fast 40-plus class, this year's HYS One Ton Cup took the fleet onto another level. There were no runaway leaders, and several had a taste of the front end of the fleet. Peter Morton's Girls on Film, Stuart Whitehead's Rebellion, Steve Cowie's Zephyr, Tony Dickens' Jubilee, Bastavug's Hitchhiker, and Heinz Peter Schmidt's Silver Neo all had podium finishes on the first day's racing. But as the regatta played out, a pecking order developed with Morton's Girls on Film taking a lead. A second consecutive one-ton victory looked likely for the cows base team. Until, that is, the penultimate race of the event. Morton's team jumped the gun and had to restart, placing them at the back of the fleet. Hauling their way back to fourth and discarding their sixth place in the final race was sufficient to maintain their overall lead. The message was clear. The Fast 40 Plus is a hot fleet and getting hotter. So what makes these 40-foot carbon rockets tick? The World Sailing Show went aboard to find out. My name is Anthony Haynes. Um, I'm boat captain and uh, part of the crew of Pace, which is this boat. We sail the boat with 11 crew, and sort of going from the back, you'll back here you'll have more the navigator navigator roles and the tactician. Here you have various controls. Here, these this is the, the pedestal, which obviously controls the winches, which are engaged through these buttons, which lead under deck to various drive shafts 
and gearboxes that link forward so the buttons obviously engage and disengage the winches and when you tack you obviously tack or jibe you change to the other to the other side then you have um, a helmsman who will be sort of obviously more square to the tiller here he'll be in this area and generally will spend most of his time sort of sitting you know sitting here fit with the foot bars to keep his back out to the guard wire so he'll be sat sort of out here with the adjustable tiller extension steering the boat in this area this is sort of middle of the boat so it's the main the main sort of hub where all the sort of sail handling work is coordinated from. This area here is what we, we call the pit. We hoist quite a lot of our sails using these winches because they're a lot more powerful, bigger, and they're driven by the pedestal. So typically, and, and then we can cross lead a halyard typically to a left side winch like that. So then we have versatility to use either winch. So here at the mast, you can see that there are, there are only two, two halyards coming out of the mast, spinnaker halyard and a jib halyard. There'll be no other controls. Everything else is led down below deck to keep the deck free. This is what we call our four hatch. Um, fundamentally, we use this for getting sails up and down from, on, from below. Here we have the spinnakers. These are our two that we used yesterday. So different codes on them, illustrating what wind they should be used in and, and thus different shapes. So this would be our A4. This would be the heavy wind spinnaker or the heaviest spinnaker we carry on board. And this is our A2 Plus. This is, um, obviously this is the mast coming down through the deck opening. From there you sort of, you can see where the mast is situated and underneath here, this whole structure is basically the sort of load area of the boat. Okay, so here we are more towards the, the middle of the boat. This is just the house switches which turns on the instruments, bilge pumps, uh, deck screens, etc. Um, these are the battery switches and interestingly batteries now we run with uh, these very lightweight lithium ion batteries. This saves a huge amount of weight and you see we have three green green top house batteries we call them. They run the boat systems. Then we have this one orange battery here which is purely allocated for starting the engine. The, the boats are a challenge on windy days like today it's fairly challenging. Um, but they are a lot of fun and very rewarding when you get it right. Chicago played host to the penultimate event of the World Match Racing Tour. GAC Pindar skipper Ian Williams and his crew forced their way through to defeat current match racing world champion Phil Robertson. Next stop for the tour is Shenzhen, China, where the battle between Robertson and Williams will be put to the test for the final time in 2017. Italian team Azura won the final TP52 regatta of the year in Menorca. Their victory saw them take the Super Series title as well, in a season that has stood out for its close racing throughout. On the final day of the regatta, four boats were capable of taking the title. Round one of the 2017-2018 World Cup Series got underway in Gamagori, Japan. The event saw over 250 sailors representing 38 countries taking part. Among the close competition throughout the fleets, Olympic gold medalists Tom Burton and Pablos Condides we're taking on 2017 world and European champion Nick Thompson in the laser. We'll be bringing you what happened in this hotly contested fleet, along with all the other action in next month's show. Among the many glamorous venues that play host to the world's biggest and best yachts, there is one that has remained at the top of the list for years. Porto Cervo, Sardinia. Stunning scenery and legendary conditions, no one needs persuading to attend. Especially given the yacht club Costa Smeralda's acknowledged reputation for running high quality regattas. First of all, we are in Porto Cervo, that I think that is the best place for sailing in the world. It's a fantastic place. You enjoy it because the scenery is spectacular, the, the wind is subtle and shifty and, and tricky, and so when you do well, you feel rewarded by it. 
But there is an even simpler reason why the Maxi Rolex Cup is such a big deal. It's the Mediterranean magnet for the world's biggest, fastest and advanced Grand Prix Maxi races and super yachts. The gathering also includes some of the most elegant yachts in the world. This is the race that everybody wants to win. It's addictive. You come back because you want some more and as, as long as you have the strength to do it, I think I will still be coming back. But this year was particularly special. An impressive 50-boat fleet for the Yacht Club's 50th anniversary. There were seven classes in total, including the powerful Super Maxis, the famous Wally class, and everything else in between, from performance cruisers to out-and-out -out Grand Prix races. In the Maxi and Mini Maxi racing fleets, Irvine Laidlaw's Highland Fling 11 and Sir Peter Ogden's Jet U each led their classes. In the Mini Maxi Racer cruiser classes, two Italian yachts, Super Nica and H2O, dominated their groups too. But the Maxi Yacht Rolex Cup is also a showcase for the very latest and technically advanced super yachts. Here, the 33-metre Maltese yacht Ribelle won the Super Maxi class on her first competitive outing. Meanwhile, in the Wally class, the 30-metre Galatea was pushed hard at the front of the fleet, but went on to win overall against an impressively strong field. But the closest racing was in the Maxi 72s, where the fleet locked horns in a bid for their world championship title. Dieter Schoen's Momo was the favourite and quickly confirmed why, as his team built an early points lead. But their rivals were out to ensure that the German crew were not going to have an easy ride. The racing was close. Momo was pushed hard. And while Schoen's team did finally win the title, it was by just one point. First, we improved our boat in, in a lot of details, and then we improved as a team and this made it possible to win here. But while winning was the main goal for those taking part, the spectacle and showcase of the world's biggest and best is what keeps bringing competitors and spectators back. Next month, big cups in China. Fast boats in Cape Town and hot news from Mexico.